Last week, we dove into the first couple verses of Hebrews 8, and then what we did in the first six verses is we talked about how verses 1 through 6 serves as an introduction to what the writer is going to talk about in chapter 7, 8, I'm sorry, chapter 8, 9, and 10. And he's going to talk about how Jesus is so much better than anything else we could ever have. And he expounds on this idea that Jesus is the real deal. He's better than anything we could ever find in this world. He's better than anything we can dream about. He's better than any other pursuits that we have, that Jesus is so much better. And what he does in the first six verses is he shows that he gives a brief introduction. And he, beginning in verse 7 on, he starts to expound on this. And what he does is he begins by saying that Jesus is a real deal. Jesus is so much better because the covenant that Jesus creates is built on better promises. It's built, built on promises that are so much more powerful, so much more relevant, so much more unique than what the old covenant offered. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to um, expound on what these promises are, these promises that Jesus gives to us in the new covenant. This morning I woke up and I uh, kind of groggy walked into the kitchen. I saw the milk sitting in the kitchen um, table. We forgot to put it in the fridge. In fact, just for my illustration purposes, I've left it out all week. Now, if I woke up this morning and I walked over to my kitchen and I took this milk and I opened it up and not paying attention, began to pour it in. And there's little gobbly things. I don't know if you could see that. Um, that's pouring into there. And if I wasn't paying attention and I took a whiff of that, which I won't do, um, that would have been the most horrible experience. I talked last week about how I was in hospital for a week over food poisoning. That would have probably, um, probably would have been just about the same. It would have been a nasty, nasty experience of tasting something. If I wanted a fresh cup of milk, this gallon of milk would not suffice my need. It wouldn't meet the needs that I have. And so what I would need to do is if I wanted a fresh cup of milk, I would need to go and buy a new gallon of milk that was fresh, that I could pour in and drink that doesn't smell nasty. And so turn with me to Hebrews 8. And this is where we're going. We're going to talk about how what was there is expired and what's been given is so much better. Hebrews 8, verses 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make to the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each to his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Go back to verse 7. this morning. Uh, go back to verse 7. The implication there, the idea that the first one is fault, there's faults in the first one, is the idea that, um, it's there, that there's something wrong with the first covenant, that there's something not working with the first covenant. And because there was something wrong with the first covenant, there's a need for something better. There's a need for something new. There's need for something that will work more effectively to accomplish the purposes for what the first one was designed for but was ineffective to do. We talked last week that, um, to recap, every year the people of Israel would have to bring bulls and goats to the high priest to make sacrifices because they were sinful people. They, they would live in sin, and because of their sin, they would have to make these sacrifices and for God to forgive them of their sins. The high priest also had to make sacrifices for himself 
He would have to constantly make sacrifices on a yearly basis because he was sinful. And because of his sin, he'd have to make his own sacrifices, and then he would go into the Holy of Holies and make sacrifices for the people. This is something that had to be done every year, year after year, working out their salvation. They kept sacrificing, they kept working, because they were sinful people just like us. Their means of salvation was by the works that they did. Why is that relevant? Why does that matter to us? Because may I suggest that there are a lot of us in this room, including myself, that even though we believe that we are saved by the grace of God, that we are saved because of what Jesus did, a lot of us are trying to earn our salvation or earn God's favor based on what we do. We work, we labor, we strive to make sure we do the things that are acceptable to God so that God will bless us and approve of us so that all of our activities, our spiritual disciplines of praying and reading the Bible and even being here this morning is not out of our love for God, but it's to make sure that God approves of us. It's to make sure that God accepts us so that we can, so we can show God how good we are and we can show him that we deserve his grace. We aren't living in a grace that says that we do our devotions, our prayers, our worship because God has already approved of us, because God has already accepted us. We live, whether we admit it or not, to doing these things to somehow receive God's approval and, in fact, show other people how good we are. And in a sense, what we're doing is we're living out the old covenant. We're constantly working. We're constantly striving. We're constantly laboring to earn God's approval, trying to make sure our good outweighs our bad. Our standard of whether we are good or not is other people. So we'll make comments like, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I wouldn't go into a mall and murder random people like what was happening in Kenya yesterday. I would do, never do anything like that bad. So I'm better than them. God must approve of me better than some of these other people. Or our prayers and requests to God is based on how good we perform. God, I do so much for you. God, look at all that I do. I give, I tithe, I go to church, I pray, I do this. You have to bless me, right? Or God, um, if you do this for me, then I will do something for you. It's based on what we do. We're trying to win God's approval or earn God's favor. And the danger there is instead of being in a close relationship with the Father, we're trying to win the approval of a God who is basically checking us out to see whether we are doing good or whether we're doing bad. And the problem is that there is never enough good that we can do to outweigh the bad that we have done. That's where the old covenant was flawed. This is why they constantly had to keep making sacrifices year after year, um, decade after decade. They were constantly making sacrifices. This is where our works before God is flawed. This is where simply trying to keep the rules or the laws is flawed. You'll always be doing. You'll always be working. You'll always be laboring. But the new covenant says you don't have to labor. You can rest because I have done everything for you. I've done it for you. And the writer of Hebrews, what he does in our text is he gives us several reasons why the new covenant is so much better than the old covenant. It's so much better because the old covenant was based on work and performance, but the new covenant is based on what has already been completed by Jesus. And he gives us several different things that are so important for us to know. And the first thing he says is the new covenant in Jesus is radically different from what the old covenant was. In verses 7 through 9, he shows us that the new covenant that Jesus gives is better than the one that the Israelites could never keep. He gives us sharp distinctions between the failures of the old covenant and the guaranteed success of the new covenant. And I want to show you some ways that what we have in Jesus is so much better than trying to earn this thing on our own, trying to work and labor. Let me give you about eight things that are why what we have in Jesus is so much better than what, what's out there. Number one, see the law or working or striving never provides a, a way for us to be justified by faith. But the new covenant, it does. Think about it. The law, the rituals, the rules, they never bring acquittal to us. They actually bring condemnation. Because when we break the rules, we know we're messed up. Because none of us are ever able to keep the rules. If you want to be made right with God without Jesus, all you have to do is live a perfect life from birth till death. 
both internally and externally. Your actions toward other people have to be perfect. Your actions toward your siblings, perfect. Your actions toward your parents, perfect. Your actions toward your boss, perfect. Now, if that was good, one thing. But your attitude has to be perfect. Your thoughts, what you think about other people has to be perfect. The problem is we're flawed before we even begin. We're born in a sinful nature. We're born with sinful nature in a sinful world, raised by sinful parents, surrounded by sinful people. We are doomed for failure even before we begin. It's like coming up to bat in baseball and you've already got three strikes against you. You're already out. What's the point? I use this illustration all the time, but I don't have to teach my kids. I've got three now. One likes to pee all over himself all the time lately. That's my three-month-old. Two, this morning, two times um, he's done it. Um, I don't have to teach them to be bad. I don't have to teach them what to do wrong. I don't have to teach my six-year-old to go punch his, his sister. He knows how to do that stuff on his own. I've got to teach them to do good. I've got to constantly sit down and say, you can't do that. This is, that's not a good behavior. That's not what you're supposed to do. I don't have to teach them to get mad or angry or do all that stuff. And the other challenge of that is they are living in an environment where they're raised by sinful parents. I'm not perfect. They see me get angry. They see me get frustrated. They see me um, doing things I'm not supposed to do. And so not only are they born sinful, the heaviest influencers on their life are sinful. They're doomed even before they begin. The old covenant, trying to keep the rules, trying to live right, trying to live perfect, will never bring you justification. But the new covenant isn't based on what you do. It's based on who you know. It's based on Jesus. That Jesus says that when I die for you, I will change you, but you are not going to be righteous before me based on whether you are able to live a perfect life, but you will be justified before me whether you trusted me or not. See, the new covenant is radically different because it's not based on what we do. The second thing, the law could never give you spiritual life, but the new covenant, it gives you a brand new life. The law, the rules are all external things that tell you, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do this. But the new covenant, God says in our text, that he writes the law in our heart. And then he takes residence in our heart. He gives us a brand new heart. He makes us brand new people. In the old covenant, because we're trying to live by the rules, we're dead, ineffective, unable to reach God, have no desire for God. We're like corpses that were propped up, expected to do something, but we can't because we're dead. It needs life. But the new covenant is not just a new set of rules. It's God coming inside of us, taking residence in us and saying, not only are you going to be able to do the things you were never able to do before, but I'm going to help you do it. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. I'm going to walk with you. When you're being tempted to go that way, I'm going to tell you, don't go that way, go this way. I'm going to walk, be there every step of the way with you. The new covenant gives us a brand new life. Well, we're not just trying to do something. We're living a life that's radically different than what we didn't have in Jesus, before Jesus. So you've got to ask the question, what's the purpose of the law anyway? Why did God give the law? See, the whole purpose of the law was to show us how sinful we are, to show us how messed up we are so that we can be driven by faith to Jesus. See, deep inside all of us, we think we're good people. All of us think we're okay. We never murder. We never cheat on our spouses. We never steal. We never do the things that the Ten Commandments tells us not to do. We're better than a ton of people, especially those evil people that you see on TV all the time. We're all prone to think that we're okay because we think we're better than someone else. But listen, God's standard for your life is not your neighbor. God's standard of holiness is Jesus. And he's perfect. So he doesn't compare you and say, well, you are better than this person. He says, you never met the standard of Jesus. And Jesus is that ultimate standard. 
See, and if you can't meet his standards, you'll never be made right with God. That's why the law fails. That's why we need Jesus. And in spite of that, we think we're okay because we're able, we keep the law more than other people do. And we look down on other people that don't keep the law. We judge other people that aren't living right. We condemn other people that are struggling in their sins. Isn't that what the Pharisees did in the, in the New Testament? They would walk around and they would say, well, I never murder. And Jesus looks at them and says, if you even got angry with your brother, you're guilty of not murder. They're like, well, I've never committed adultery. I'm pure. I stay loyal to my wife. And Jesus comes in and says, wait, if you even look lustfully at a woman, no one ever knows it, but it's in your mind. You've already committed adultery. See, the law and the rule keeps, what it does is it defines and magnifies our sinfulness. This shows us how messed up we are. It shows us that we are horrible people, that we can never keep the rules of God. And so what it does is it drives us to Jesus and saying, Jesus, help. Number four, the law leads to bondage, not freedom. The law can never free us from sin. Peter calls us the law a yoke that one could never bear. We're stuck, always trying to win approval by keeping the rules. And before we ask, go on, we got to ask the question, does it mean that we don't keep the law anymore, that it's irrelevant to us? Not at all. Our text says that now that God writes the law on our hearts, meaning that this changes our entire attitude, our entire motivation. So then now we desire to obey the law, not because we're trying to win God's approval. We Obey the law because we love God and want to honor him. See, one was trying to say, God, here I am doing right, accept me. The other is saying, God, I am so in love with you and what you've done for me. I want to do the things you're calling me to do. Right? And so the, the freedom that we have in Christ completely transforms how the law looks for us. Number five, the law and the rules and the regulations have frightening penalties for disobedience. But the new covenant isn't based on whether we obey or not. It's based on God's promises and initiative. Deuteronomy 28 is a beautiful passage that lists the blessings for obedience and the consequences for disobedience to the law. See, if we had the ability to obey the law and do what God's calling us to do, that chapter would be a huge source of encouragement for us. The fact that we fail at keeping the law reveals the stubborn, sinful nature of our hearts apart from Jesus. And our text says that God found fault in the Israelites because they couldn't keep the law. See, but the new covenant, what we have in Jesus, is marked by success because it doesn't depend on my weak, sinful nature, but it depends on the sole purpose of God. If you skim through verses 8 through 10, God repeatedly says, I will, I will. I will. He does this to emphasize that in the new covenant is so much better than the old because it's based on God's promises, God's purpose, God's will, not on the promise of sinful people trying to do what God's calling them to do. This is based on who God is and what God is working. The old covenant could never provide full and complete forgiveness of our sins, but the new one completely does. Hebrews 9 says it's impossible for sacrifices, the bulls and goats, to take away the sins of our lives. So they had to keep sacrificing over and over and over. But Jesus, with his once and for all offering, puts away our sins once and for all, past, present, and future. He deals with all of it at once. See, the other flaw of the old covenant in the old covenant it kept worshipers at a distance from god they could never get close to god they could never get into the presence of god the old covenant the closest you could get was to the outskirts of the temple or the tabernacle only one person can get into the holy of holies where god was and that was the high priest and even he could only enter one time a year he couldn't go in more than once and he had to be very careful because he he went in with sin. He would drop dead because of God's holiness. You never were able to get close to God in the old covenant. But because of the new covenant, we saw this a couple weeks ago, Jesus says now we can draw near to God. 
We can be close to him. He is our father. He embraces us. He loves us. He calls us his own. He makes us his children. We can draw near to him. It provides the very thing we need, but we can never get. Intimacy with the Father. Verse 10. The second thing that the Hebrew, the writer of Hebrew talks about is that the new covenant involves God putting his law into our minds and hearts of his people. Look at verse 10. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. See, in the old covenant, in trying to keep the rules and the regulations, we have to try to keep it all on our own. The rules were there, and we were expected to keep it. I don't know, I don't know about you, but these rules, they're incredibly hard to keep. It's incredibly hard to not get angry with people. It's incredibly hard not to lust. It's incredibly hard to meet God's standards of perfection. But in the new covenant, God says, I'm going to give you a new heart, and I'm going to put a new spirit inside of you. I will remove your heart of stone that has no desire for me, and I'm going to give you a brand new heart. I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my ways. In the new covenant, God promises that he is going to be with us every step of the way to give us the, give us the life that we were intended to live and help us to live it. We aren't in it alone. He lives inside of us. That's the promise of the new covenant. God is with you. There's another thing. In verse 10, the second part of it, it says, um, it says, I will be their God. They will be my people. It says that he will be in a close, intimate relationship with us. He's ours personally. As his people, we can go to him as his children, as a ch child goes to a father to receive from him the things that we need. We're his in a special sense. He bought us with the blood of Jesus so that we are not our own. We belong to Jesus. We belong to him. The fourth thing there, verse 11. The new covenant means that every person, from the least to the greatest, can know God personally. Verse 11. They shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother know the Lord, but they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. See, the writer is saying that because of the new covenant, there's no second-class citizens in God's eyes. In the old covenant, the high priest, cool people, they talk to God. Everyone else talks to the high priest who talks to God. But you can never talk to God directly. You just can't talk to the mediator guy. The new covenant, you don't necessarily need a mediator guy. You're, you can go to God directly. You can talk to him directly. See, we're all equal in the eyes of God. We're all one in God's eyes. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean that somehow I have special gear to God that you don't have. I don't. The same God that hears me when I pray is the same God that hears you when you pray. The same God that answers me when I pray is the same God that answers you when you pray. I'm no higher in God's eyes because I do this than you are because you do something else. What we're all doing is what God has called us to do. We're living out our faith in the places where he called us. And he says we are all equal in God's eyes. When you sin, you can go to him directly. You don't need someone to stand between you and him. When you sin, you can run to God who is your savior. You don't need a priest. You don't need a dead saint. You don't need anyone else to pray on your behalf. What, when you need help, God invites you directly to say, draw near to me. Run to me because I am a merciful God. I will forgive you. I will restore you. I will put you back on the path. God invites you, draw near to me because I care for you. See, if you are in Christ, the Bible teaches you are a priest. 
you can go to God directly. You can make intercession to God. You can pray to God. You're a priest. Verse 12 is so powerful. And verse 12 says the biggest benefit of the new covenant is that it offers complete forgiveness of all of our sins. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. The writer saves the best promise for last. Forgiveness is a fundamental need that all of us need because we have all sinned against a holy God. It's also the basis for which all of the other promises are built on. Because until our sins are forgiven, none of those other blessings are ours. We will not be able to draw near to him if our sins are not forgiven. We will not be able to understand his word if our sins are not forgiven. The basis of God's forgiveness is his mercy that's shown at the cross. And God uses the strongest word possible to make his point here. Here's what he says. He says, I will not ever in any way recall any of their sins to my mind ever and forever. I will not ever, ever recall any of their sins to my mind ever and forever. If I have forgiven you, it will never come back to my mind. That's what God promises to us. See, we're flawed because if you sin against me, even if I forgive you, I'm not going to forget it. If you hurt me, I'll I'll accept your forgiveness. I'll accept your apologies. But in the back of my mind, it'll always be there. But God says, I will never, ever bring back to my mind those things that you have done against me ever and forever. It is forgiven once and for all. In the new covenant, God has a solution for our sins that he will never, ever repay your sins forever and ever. You're completely forgiven. Real forgiveness total and complete forgiveness. No more guilt. No more shame. No more brokenness. No more separation from God because of my sin. Real, total forgiveness. No more sin ever. Jesus Christ is the mediator. He is the guarantor. He is the perfect offering for enacting better promises for this better covenant. Listen, in Jesus, you can experience the better promises. He will be your God. You will be his people. His law will be written on your heart so that you can be constantly driven to Jesus. And when you go to Jesus, you will find all of the depravity of your heart has been washed clean, and now you have righteousness. Righteousness that belongs to Jesus that has now been given to you. Jesus, the sinless Son of God, paid the penalty that we deserved so that we could stand righteous before God. Not on the basis of our works, not on the basis of how good we are, but on the basis of the fact that while we were yet sinners, God sent his Son to die and take our place. Listen, if we truly understood the great cost that Jesus paid so that God could be merciful to our sins, none of us in this room would go happily continuing in our sin if we truly understood it. We will hate sin. We will strive against sin. We will do our best to avoid sin out of love for our Savior who gave himself for us. Not trying to earn something from God, but we will avoid it and hate it because we are in love with God. Jesus gives us forgiveness of our sins. Verse 13 closes the chapter, and he says this. He says, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and is what is becoming obsolete, growing old, is ready to vanish away. See, if you've ever done what I did by taking a cup of sour milk and drinking it, you know that's a horrible experience. You probably had one of the worst food experiences of your life. I don't know how many times someone had to do that before they realized that they could put a little expiration date right on the carton, right? And that expiration date is kind of a really, really good thing because it tells you this is good or it's not good. The date is incredibly helpful. Best if used by or expires on. It helps us out. 
I like that because you can look at the date and you can gauge whether or not it's still good or not. If the date is just a couple days old, you can still open it up, you can smell it, and you can realize if it's good or not. If it smells okay, you can try to pour it and see if there's any gobbly stuff coming out. And if there is, then you probably know the purpose of drinking the milk, it's not relevant anymore. It's not useful anymore. You discard it. You get rid of it. The date tells me that the milk has lost its usefulness and it's approaching a time when it needs to be destroyed. Listen, when Jesus died on the cross, he initiates a new covenant for us. And at that point of history, the old covenant has been stamped with an expiration date. It's expired. It is no longer relevant. You can take it, stick it on your shelves. You can take it, throw it away, discard it. Its usefulness has been drastically altered. So now between the expiration of the old covenant and the next significant date in the timeline is when Jesus returns. That's the next significant date. And when Jesus returns, what happens is that the old covenant at that point will be completely destroyed. It will be no longer relevant at all. The date of its destruction is when Jesus returns. So we're in this period now between a time where the old covenant had expired and we're longing for when the old covenant will be completely destroyed when Jesus comes. And we're getting closer to that date. It's incredibly important that we get this this morning. The promise of the new covenant is not fully experienced until the old covenant is completely destroyed. But when the old covenant expires, we get to experience a continual tasting a continual savoring, a sampling of what's going to happen when we see Jesus forever. All of the blessings we have now is just a small taste for what we're going to enjoy when we're with Jesus forever. Here's what this means for you and for me. Here we are living between the tension of these two dates. It's expired, but there's coming a day when it will be permanently destroyed. Through faith in Jesus, we're living out this new covenant. I'm looking for its complete fulfillment when Jesus returns. So right now, I'm living in this body that is broken by sin, that's messed up by sin. But because God has enacted a new covenant, it means that I'm no longer controlled by sin. It no longer dictates what I do, but it still affects how I live. But there is coming a day when I will stand before Jesus and my body is not going to be repaired, it's going to be brand new. And that body is no longer going to be tarnished with sin. It's gonna, no longer going to be going to be affected by sin. The power of sin has been completely destroyed from my life. Right now we struggle. The sin has no longer power over us, but we still struggle with it. But there is a day coming when our sin will be completely destroyed and we will stand with new bodies before Jesus, our Savior, and all of the promises that have been given in this covenant will be completely fulfilled. We will be made perfect before God. So this week, if you sinned against God in a way that you can't even imagine you would have ever sinned and you are feeling terrible about it and you are full of guilt and shame and remorse and sorrow, then I want to encourage you this morning to let the conviction of the Holy Spirit drive you to Jesus in spite of your sin, remind you to run to Jesus, receive his grace and forgiveness. And instead of living in the old covenant, which is expired, live in the new covenant. Live in a covenant where God promises forgiveness for your sins, past, present, and future. Walk in the new covenant. Walk understanding you are forgiven. You are cleansed. You are a child of God. You don't have to earn his favor anymore. You don't have to earn his acceptance anymore. But every time you fall, he is there to remind you, get up, keep walking, keep striving, keep Keep living for him. He doesn't give up on you, even if you give up on yourself. The new covenant says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never abandon you. I will be with you every step of the way. Listen, the new covenant promises that God isn't looking for your faithfulness and your perfection. He's looking for you to keep trusting him even when you can't be perfect, even when you can't do the things he expects of you, but you keep running to him and you keep running to him and you keep running to him and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I need your help. The new covenant is so much better. Someday Jesus will return. 
My body is not going to be repaired. It's going to be replaced with something that's perfect. Which means that everything that Christ has done, I will get to experience fully. So that I will have every sin not just forgiven, but completely removed, eradicated, done away with, so that it's like it's never happened to this body. It will be perfect. See, what that means is that for the rest of eternity, I get to experience the infinite character of God in perfection so that I will have ever-increasing joy, ever-increasing satisfaction, ever-increasing purpose because of what Christ has done for me. So listen, live today like the old has expired and your sins can no longer separate you from God. He's forgiven you. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, he has promised you that he will never remember your sins. Listen, live like that. Because you don't want to miss a moment of experiencing the grace of the new covenant. And you certainly want to be ready for the day when the old is completely destroyed and the new is completed. Let me tell you one more thing and I'll close. You don't want to miss it. But you also don't want other people in your life to miss it. There are people in your life that don't know how good Jesus is, that don't know how amazing he is. So they have made these gods in their lives, whether it's money or success or career or family or whatever it is that they're looking to find true joy in, and they're not finding it because true joy only comes in Jesus. And God has put you into their lives. He didn't just simply put you there by accident. He didn't simply put you there because that was the best place for you to be. He put you there on purpose. Because when this promises affect your life, when you understand who you are in Jesus, your life becomes radically different. Your life becomes radically transformed that you can tell people, listen, Jesus is the real deal. Jesus is amazing. Jesus is wonderful. Jesus is so beautiful. What he gives me in the new covenant is more than I could ever imagine, more than I could ever dream, and listen, more than I can ever deserve. It is amazing what Jesus does. And he invites you not just to simply enjoy it, but he invites you to share it with the people around you. That is why you are at the jobs where you are at. That's why you're at the campuses where you are at, not simply to get an education, but to share how good he is. So let me invite you, live this out. Live out the new covenant. Live out as if you have been forgiven all of your sins. Walk with joy. Walk with a smile on your face. Walk knowing that God has done for you what you don't deserve. Let the world see that you are radically different because of Jesus. And when God opens those doors for you, when people say, why are you different? You begin to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He has saved you. He has given you a new covenant. He's given you better promises. Live like it. You don't, you're not defeated individuals. You're a child of the king. This morning as we come to the communion table, let me remind you again, you're forgiven. You're free. Not because of what you did. Not because of how good you were this week. Not because of how much you gave. You are forgiven because someone was willing to take your place. Take the punishment that you deserve so that you could experience the blessings that only he deserves. So as we come to the table, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires from this past week. If there's anything in your heart that's not, if God convicts you of anything of your life that wasn't from Jesus, I'm going to invite you to just simply repent, confess, draw near to Jesus. Ask him for, your, for his help. Say, Jesus, help. And then I'm going to invite you to come to the table, grab the elements. The way we do communion here at Loft is you are 
Whenever you are ready, you come and grab the elements and then you come back to your seats. And in a few moments, I will come and we'll partake of the table together. But examine your heart. Are you living in the new covenant? Are you simply working and striving and laboring, burning yourself out, trying to win the approval of God? And you're never full of joy. You're never full of satisfaction. You're never full of purpose because you're burning out. If that's you, run to Jesus this morning. He's ready to give you rest that you deserve. Let's pray. Father, this morning, there's a lot in here. I pray that your spirit will bring to remembrance the things that we need to be reminded of. Remind us of how great you are. That we don't need to run and strive and labor and work. We just need to simply trust in Jesus. If we're living in this life and we're just trying to do this on our own, Father, this morning, would you draw us to you? Remind us of your great love for us. As we come to the table, would you examine our hearts? Would your spirit convict us? Would you transform us? We love you.